So first of all, thanks very much to Dennis. I don't know if he's back from the break, but uh, he's right here okay. for setting up uh, uh, very beautifully and clearly very, very many points for me to disagree with. Um, I would probably cover it at uh, the most half of them, but uh, that will be something as well. I uh, redid my uh, presentation as Dennis was speaking. So it um, grew from 30 slides to 60 slides. I'm not sure the order is fine. Um, most of these slides I'll be seeing for the first time myself, so I hope they're okay. And I hope this didn't mess up things too much. We'll try to uh, follow. And I'll, I'm also looking at the clock. I wanted to leave enough time for discussion. So I'll try to run them by a slide per minute or something like that. Uh, um, before I start, I want to, of course, thank the organizers for this uh, wonderful conference workshop. I'm learning a, a great deal from, from the physicists uh, that have given these uh, wonderful presentations here. I'm afraid that I can't really return the service. Um, I think everybody here, including the scientists, know most of the philosophy I'll be talking about. Um, but I do want to raise some questions. Uh, which I think have, again, they're not new questions, but I think they've become uh, marginalized over the years, um, more so over the last 20, 30 years, and I think are important. I think they become marginalized, um, s among other reasons, because some views, maybe even some dogmas, uh, have been adopted, and I feel have been adopted too hastily, too quickly. Um, and a certain view, or family of views, associated with the science uh, has become entrenched and, and as Dennis uh, uh, described it, uh, are now regarded as the dominant view and I think these views are very problematic. That's, uh, that's, uh, th these are the questions I want to I wanna raise here. Um, don't want to be too much of a party pooper but, uh, but um, um, Ego said that we all agree on physical time they want to scream from the back there, I don't, but uh, <laughs> I don't agree. I don't know exactly what physical time means, but whatever it means, I don't think I... Well, this agreement that uh, supposedly achieve exists... Achievements of the physical time. Achievements of, achievements of physics, or even better, achievement of physicists. That's something that I think we all uh, agree about. Physical time is a problematic notion. I may be the only one here who sees the problem, but at least uh, there's some dead philosophers here with me that were mentioned. Uh, James, even his picture was here. You mentioned Barclay, which was a bit surprising because he wouldn't be part of this consensus either. Um, uh, but so, so I, I think my main agenda is to raise uh, some questions. I very much connect to what uh, Professor Kohn um, said after his lecture. These were post-lecture remarks about doubt. Um, indeed, I think that uh, skepticism, by which I mean skepticism of the ancient kind, the, the skepticism ordinarily associated with uh, Sextus Empiricus, uh, the Stoics, and so on, is, has been throughout history uh, a main engine in philosophy and an important one. Um, and uh, thanks to, to Pierre Hadot, the, the, the French philosopher, um, the Socratic uh, spirit of, of, of doubt is uh, seeing some revival, not enough, but a little bit, both uh, here in, in Europe and also in, uh, in America. And it's, it's, it's a spirit of raising questions and, and, and raising doubts um, rather than stating uh, dogmas. Um, and just as, with respect to my own personal uh, sentiments, I have to say that as time goes by, uh, my sense that we really understand very little, and always much less than we think we understand, uh, grows all the time, and that, that pertains to, to the notion of time as well. And it's important that I say this because from now on I'll be stating very uh, convincingly dogmas that uh, I'll be willing to, <laughs> to fight with you till we're blue in the face. Okay, so with all these pr preliminaries, um, I want to talk about uh, this distinction and, and, and question this disti distinction between human time and um, physical time or between, as it's sometimes uh, known, and this is, this is, uh, these are terms that uh, Janan Ismail that was mentioned before uses between the manifest and, and the scientific images of uh, time. And let me jump to the last slide of the talk and give you the moral of the talk, 
we can stop there and start arguing. <laughs> or if you'll give me a chance, I'll try to work my way to the moral. But I, I'd like to state the moral and it was written just now. So let's see if I still stand behind it. So one thing that I uh, uh, am convinced of is that there is only one time, and that is the time as we, uh, time as we know it from experience. We don't have any, any, any uh, uh, channels to, to reality other than our experience, and therefore, in an almost trivial, trivial way, anything we know, we know from experience, and that, ex that includes whatever we know about time. Um, so, and from experience, since, or since there is this one time, experience time, the distinction between physical time and human time is very problematic. There are, these are not two different times, as sometimes you could get the, uh, an impression from some of the texts. Rather, time, the one time, time as it figures in experience, can be studied in more than one way. Phenomenologically is one way, and scientifically, of course, is another way. And all is well as long as we don't get in each other's way and try to do each other's job, which is something that happens a lot, and, 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 and I'll, I'll be upfront on this, I think there's an asymmetry here. It's usually the physicists that do, or purport to do, the philosopher's work and not the other way around. Philosophers know they cannot do physics. Um, and if there aren't these two times, there's a, then there's no issue of reconciling experience time with physical time. Um, Specifically, as I will elaborate, there is no issue of, 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 of squaring or reconciling the black universe picture, which is usually the, the one gleaned from, from science, with uh, experienced time. And I'll explain what I mean by this uh, in the talk. Another conviction of mine is that time flows, and by f time's passage... Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not going to distinguish between flow, passage, and tense. In this talk, at least, I'll use these interchangeably. Ismail distinguishes flow from passage, um, and some people take tense to be something different from flow. For me, when I speak of uh, flow, what I mean is very simply the becoming of future events present uh, and of present events uh, uh, past. And that's all there is to it, but this becoming of future events present and present events past, I take to be part of the, for lack of better terms, uh, fundamental structure of reality, not something subjective, not something that um, uh, is psychological and so on. Remember, this is the end of the talk, okay? So I'll argue for this a little bit. Um, and if there's, a, if there's a controversy regarding the so-called black universe, it's not a scientific one. So another thing that I want to stress up front is that um, there's this hundred-year-old uh, debate about whether time, real time, is tensed or not, and, and, and Dennis uh, presented the, what I think started this debate, the, the, the McTaggart argument, and then, the, and then arguments from, from physics came in, and other arguments, conceptual arguments, such as Parfit. Um, it's, a long, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relatively long, uh, ancient uh, uh, debate. I, I want to emphasize it's not a debate in science, so it's not a debate that I think we can even conceive of a, of a situation in which this debate will be resolved or even helped by turning to, to uh, a scientific theory. Okay, so that was the moral. Now a few words about what human time is or the way it's usually portrayed, then a few words about uh, physical time. So the essence of human time is passage, the becoming future events present and the present events past. And human time, I'm just pointing this out, I don't think this is controversial in any way, is essential for much of what is significant to us. So outside of these workshops and conferences, the things that really matter to us are intertangled with time, and by time I mean time's passage. So without specifying, I think you all know this, our emotional attitudes towards events, uh, our emotional attitude, that's the American way, is almost invariably dependent on their tense locations. Uh, so it's one thing to be one hour before the root canal process, and it's a, an entirely different thing emotionally to be uh, a month after it. Um, our moral attitude uh, toward events is almost invariably dependent on their tense locations, and this is a topic, it's, it's an interesting topic that can be discussed at length. I'll just mention the existence of a position according to which um, uh, moral responsibility pertains only to the future. Some serious thinkers hold uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, moral theory, that moral responsibility cannot be 
um, uh, attributed to people for past actions, only for future actions. At any rate, the notions future and, and past uh, work, uh, do a lot of work in, in our moral stance inside the world, in general, in normativity. Um, one of the points that I favor uh, thinking about, um, I think it's a fact about most people that we're concerned not only about our longevity, it's not just about living a long life, uh, we're concerned also, if not especially, about not dying n uh, in the next hour or a day or so on. Um, so just being promised that you know we're going to live for 90 years is not is not an, it's important it's good of course we never get such promises but um, but it's not an, it's it's not the whole story we also want to know that we have some time left and that is already a tense uh, articulation um, a few more convictions uh, so, as I said, I take tense and passage to be part of the fundamental structure of reality. I take change and motion, which was mentioned at cer several uh, junctions in Dennis's talk, uh, not to be identifiable with, uh, with uh, what is known as Cambridge change or, or, or uh, Russell's view or the at, at theory, namely different states of a system or of whatever at different times. It's not that change is that plus something else, which would already... Uh, distance us from this theory, I think change is altogether something different from, uh, as it's very often con uh, uh, um, conceptualized by the dominant view. And I'll say here and there a few things about temporal direction, our time is short, so I don't think uh, we'll be able to, to delve too deeply into this, but I take temporal direction, direction to be intertw intertwined with passage. So ultimately, I think that when we speak about the, the distinction between earlier and later, or before and after, and so on, cannot be understood independently of time's passage. And um, just an immediate uh, consequence of this, if passage is absent from physics, as I think it is, I mean, this is, this, this is something I think everybody will agree up about, um, if passage is absent from physics and if directionality is intertwined with passage, there's a serious problem for, di for directionality in physics. To put it bluntly, I don't think physics captures directionality. I'll say a few more words about this. Um, Just recording that not everybody agrees with it. What? Just recording. Of course, I know, no, no, I think most people don't. You said everybody agrees that, not everybody. No, I think everybody agrees that the passage, passage at least in the sense in which I mean it, past, present, future, and so on, is not part of physics. But maybe not everybody agrees, so we can disagree about that as well in, 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 in a little while. But I, I should just say that uh, outside Dennis called me an exotic species, and I added uh, an exotic and endangered species. So <laughs> before you go away with what everything, I just take into account this may be the last chance you have to uh, hear, hear these things. Um, Okay, physical time, in contrast, which is what Dennis was uh, presenting and defending, uh, the time of physics, I'd rather say, because, again, physical time implies there is such a thing as physical time, uh, which is distinguished from other kinds of time. I don't understand that distinction. I understand that there's a time as it figures when people do physics, uh, and it is justifiably often associated with the bl black universe. This time is tenseless, static, doesn't flow, at least in the rich sense of passage, which, which I intend. And events in physical time are ni neither uh, future, present, or past. Uh, this distinction was, you'll see a slide of this in a minute, you all know this was, was uh, dubbed by Einstein uh, an illusion, and we'll, we'll get to that point in a minute, but I'm just presenting what physical time often, often uh, is taken to be. And in parentheses, I'm adding from the viewpoint of physical time, only longevity matters, so it doesn't make sense. If you really think that reality is tenseless, if you really think that time's passage is an illusion, there is no real distinction between past, present, and future, it makes no sense in some way, or in some sense, to, um, to worry about whether thing, how, things, how far things are from the present, to the, to the, how far they are into the past, or how far they are into the future, because this is not real. It's illusory, it's psychological, whatever it is. And in some sense, at least w one of my PhD advisors <coughs> two decades ago, uh, Derek Parfit, was very adamant about it. It's, it's irrational to let 
uh, tense work itself into one's emotional and moral stance or attitudes because it's not real. And if it's real, you know, we've got to be serious about this. If we really think that time's passage is an illusion, we ought to, we ought to live this way. Um, that's one of the morals, I think, of J.J. Of J. J. Smart, the, the Australian uh, philosopher. He says that somewhere, that the whole purpose of philosophy is to instruct us not only about the truths about reality, but also about how we should accommodate ourselves, the way we live and the way we understand ourselves inside reality, given these truths. So if you're serious about it, it shouldn't matter to you if you're going to die in a day or in 20 years. What, the only thing that should matter to you is that you have had a long and, 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 and good life. Um, I have a question. Is tense uh, equivalent to limited with uh, action potential within this limited uh, whatever entity? Um, is, is, it, is it equal to limited? Is tense, could it, could it be equal to finite limited? Uh, no, I don't think so. Don't exactly understand the proposal, but well, I don't think so. Tenses, you don't have, let's say, if I'm going, if I'm doing something and I have a limited amount of time doing it, yeah. then that time for me is pretty tense, right? Mm -hmm. Because I only have a few minutes to react, mm -hmm. and so there is a potential for reaction and action that, mm -hmm. you know, is, is kind of tense in what well, you call it tense, it's, mm -hmm. you know, compact well. in that sense, so. It's complicated. I don't. I. 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 And and, and I want to run to 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 get my sixty slides in. But um, <laughs> my uh, my take is, and I'll, I'll present it in little bits and later, is that uh, as I said, flow, tense, and so on. All these belong to reality as it is, and they'd be there even if there were no human beings. So I don't want to. There is a crucial role that human beings play here. I'll get to it. But it's not. But time does not depend on us for being what it is. Um, okay, just a little parenthesis about direction. It is debatable um, whether time as it figures in physics is, temp is temporally directed. And not only due to the uh, time reversibility and variance of the laws of nature, and I, I think a useful distinction here, not an easy one to make, but a useful distinction is between the internal time of events, uh, uh, in internal direction, excuse me, internal direction of time, so the direction that time as something, not necessarily in the Newtonian sense of something that is completely independent of what happens in it, but at any rate, time as something that has a status of its own, has a direction, and to distinguish that from the external direction of events in time, such as the melting of ice and water or whatever. Um, and just with respect to the first, so, you know, I, I, again, it's a, it's a very simple point, but uh, I think it's hard to argue with the fact that events, external direction, events have a certain structure to them, and it's a point that Dennis made as well, doesn't give uh, direction to time. Dennis made this point with respect to flow. He said that, you know, a function changing from small to big doesn't induce flow into the coordinate system. Um, in the same sense, the fact that events have a, a, a temporal structure doesn't give, doesn't give the, ti the direction of time itself, just in the same way that, you know, ordering books on a shelf, alphabetically or according to size or whatever, doesn't induce direction on space, right? It's the arrangement of the books, not of, of space. Uh, and I think an argument can be made um, to the existence of pure or internal temporal direction, which is different from the direction that we may see through by, by observing the structure of events in time. Um, so, it's, it's uh, darkened a little bit. Direction is notionally inextricable from passage. It's, I'm repeating a statement from before, and passage does not figure in any way in physics. So in some sense, direct, internal, and I, I am adding without an argument here, external, a direction cannot be captured by physics. It echoes something that Carlo said in his talk, that on the elementary level, nature is not organized in terms of uh, evolution in time. It's not exactly what he meant, but... Okay, now, supposedly there's a, a clash between physical time, static time, tenseless time, and so on, and experience time, human time. And um, this uh, um, tension uh, is the topic of, uh, of uh, much debate. And the presupposition is that it poses a problem to philosophy, maybe to science, and it needs to be tackled. And this uh, 
supposed tension is, is not new to us. It uh, has been accompanying us for the last century. Um, one important uh, uh, um, event in which this clash surfaced was the meeting between Einstein and this handsome philosopher on the right, Henri Bergson, um, in Paris in, um, uh, on the 6th of April 1922, I think. Um, and during this, uh, during this exchange, which was not an intended exchange, Einstein was supposed to have a discussion with the, one of Bergson's students, I think, and then um, Spontaneously, whoever run, ran that evening called the Bergson to the, po to, to, the, to, the, to the podium and, and, and they had a direct exchange. Um, in the course of which, among other things, and I think he spoke in French, Einstein, when he was here in Paris, uh, he said, well, if I'm going to say it, it'll probably be, it'll probably in terms of the accent be not as bad as Einstein's. <laughs> and I can also try to say it in a German accent because my grandfather uh, <laughs> put my put some German accent, no German words, but the accent into so il n'y a donc pas un temps de philosophe. I can ask him. I don't know how. Uh, anyway, it, it, well done. Um, so there is no such thing as the time of the philosophers, by which he meant very, very clearly and simply that the only thing, the only thing that exists is what we know from physics about time. The only thing that exists is what we call here physical time. All the rest, he says, there remains only a psychological time that differs from the physicist. So all the rest is just psychology. And, and, and psychology doesn't mean time. You know, there's psychology of many things, including psychology of time. But just as the psychology of music is not music, the psychology of time is not time. The time is, the only time that there is in the world is, is physical time. Yeah, uh, but Carnap, uh, tells that he discussed it. I have that in the slide. This. I have it in the slide. Yes. The she exact can. quotation. And it was Carnap who told about the uh, psychological. And he says that uh, Einstein was very unsatisfied by his answer that he's only psychological. <coughs> I have the quotation out of Carnap's autobiography. Is it, we, we save no, it's okay. questions it's for later. And just, mm -hmm. If there are clarifications with no yeah. additions right What is now? the picture uh. on the left? Okay. So, and the head is uh, Alfred North Whitehead, um, <coughs> with whom Einstein also had a disagreement. I, I, Whitehead is a, it's a, something that Ellie is working on and knows way more than I do, but oh, okay. overall, Wh Whitehead sided with Bergson uh, in, in, in this debate. And then many years later, almost 30 years after this uh, exchange in Paris, uh, in, in that famous letter to Michel Bissot's widow, uh, Einstein says that the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent uh, illusion. So the debate um, between human time and, 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 and um, scientific time is, is not new. And the notion that there's an issue here that needs to be resolved is not new as well. Uh, I'll skip some of the quotations. Uh, this is Whitehead expressing disagreement with, um, with Einstein and uh, Bergson expressing disagreement with Einstein. If anybody's interested in this, these quotations, I'll, I'll be happy to pass them on to you. But I also want to mention this book, which uh, by, by, this, by the historian Jimena Canales uh, came out, I think, uh, two, three years ago, something like that, um, which is a very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation, not only of the of the clash between Einstein and Bergson themselves, but she puts this this uh, this uh, disagreement in a very broad cultural context and connects it to many um, other uh, uh, debates that raged through uh, the 20th century. Um, it's by Princeton University Press, and it's a, it's a good read. Um, so supposedly there's a tension between the tense static time of physics and tense flowing uh, and the tense flowing character of experience time, and it's assumed that this uh, tension must be relieved. And now I want to present very very quickly two ways in which uh, philosophers have dealt with this tension. The first will be uh, Janan Ismail the, that was mentioned by Dennis, and the second will be Dennis himself. Um, so, and, and, and I need to say this, I'm not doing justice to either of them because this is very compressed. I'm just trying to give you a sense of how they tackle uh, the issue. Um, so in one paper, at least, 
Ismail um, relies on an analogy between uh, uh, experience um, relies on a spatial analogy an, analogy, an analogy between time and space to explain why experience time is not in conflict with, uh, with the physical time. So when we look at, uh, say, the rim of this cup or whatever round object you have around you at an angle, supposedly, this is again almost universally accepted, except by the exotic uh, species I belong to, um, supposedly these things look elliptical. Um, and what happens is that we attain the knowledge that a coin is really round by integrating many experiences together, looking at the coin from very many angles, maybe feeling it. But at any rate, we need a, a, a big um, uh, amount of, of different perceptions uh, in order to formulate to ourselves the knowledge and then perhaps the ability to perceive the coin as round. But initially we perceive the coin from, or the rim of this cup, from a very particular perspective. There's a certain angle, a certain distance, certain light conditions, and what we see is not the real shape of the rim of the cup or of the table or any object. Rather we see, a, we, we, we attain a perspectival uh, perception of it, then we integrate. Uh, many such perceptions and come to the understanding which then works itself perhaps automatically into, into, into experience that this thing is round. Um, so we start from a view from somewhere which is perspectival and through this uh, uh, learning process uh, come to possess a view from nowhere. And it's important to say that uh, uh, the, uh, on heart conception, it's only from nowhere that we actually see the, the, the real shape of an object. Because any particular perception that we have, which is not from nowhere but from somewhere, is going to be misleading. Even when you look at the coin heads on, you don't get the real shape of the coin. And this, is a, this is a big discussion. Uh, um, I, I, I'm happy to go into it if... You, if, if if you see fit later, um, but at any rate, that's our uh, view. So the, we start off from seeing things from a certain perspective, and then we somehow come to have a veridical understanding or, 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 or conception of, of what we're experiencing, uh, the view from uh, nowhere. And then she takes this uh, parable, if you want, and, and analogizes it to what happens in time. Claiming again that we perceive, we experience from a very certain perspective. Um, so the tenses are perspectival. It's from our perspective that this talk is happening now. Right? There's a different perspective in which Dennis's talk is, hap is happening now. It's a different now, but Dennis's talk is no less present than my talk. It's just a different present. And it depends on one's perspective. And Janan elaborates how integrating many experiences, now many experiences that are spread in time, using memories of course, anticipations and so on, enables us to somehow attain an analog, a temporal analog, um, and there's a quotation from her, of the view from nowhere. So we can have a view from nowhere on the shape of things in space, and we can also have a view from nowhere on history, and that is the black universe. That is the black universe. So the, the process involves, if I understand correctly, Janan's uh, argument, two, two, two phases. One, we start out, because there's no alternative to this, from a perspectival experience, many, many perspectival experiences, which somehow yield, through some kind of act of integration, computation, idealization, whatever, a uh, view from nowhere. And then once we are in possession of this uh, view from nowhere, the black universe, which is good both for space and for time, uh, we manage to resituate the particular perspectives within this black universe. So we can now explain retrospectively why the perspectival experiences are what they are, given that we now have 
this uh, rich structure of uh, the black universe. Now, one thing that uh, Janan is emphasizes, and I think is at the crux of what she wants to say, is that being perspectival does not mean not being real. I mean, the perspectival should not be identified, according to her, with um, the psychological, the subjective, the unreal, whatever term you want to use. Um, to the contrary, she wants to defend uh, the direction of time, which she, too, um, questions can be found within physics, but, is, but it is part of, of reality. So, so direction, the direction of time is real, even though it's not in physics. Flow and flux, by what she means, for example, what goes into your experience when you see motion. So for her to see motion is not to um, process, you know, a series of static snapshots and then come up in what sh should justifiably call the kind of qualia of motion, which is the dominant view these days, that, you know, you see motion, it's like in the movies. You internalize a, a series of static pictures, which your brain processes in a way that produces an experience of motion. She rejects that. So for her to see motion is to see motion. Motion is more than just being in different places at different times. And that's what she means by flux. But what she wants to emphasize is, is that the flux is real, and so our perception of it is a perception of something real, even though it's perspectival. In passage, the, the distinction between future, uh, present, and past is real for her. And the asymmetry between the fixity of the past and the openness of the future, if, if I read Janan correctly, this is not psychological, it's part of reality. But it is perspectival. So, uh, you know, as I said a minute ago, from our current perspective, some events are future, some events are past. From our, the perspective that we occupied yesterday, different events were future, which are now past, and so on. But that doesn't, but that, but, but, these different perspectives um, are of real things. And again, so we get the black universe in which there is no direction, there is no flux, there is no passage, and there is no asymmetry. But we refine inside this black universe all these things and see them as emerging out of the black universe, but emerging as real aspects of reality. So that's, in a nutshell, which is not, it's not nice to put people's views in a nutshell, but um, is Janan Ismail's uh, uh, suggestion. Dennis's suggestion is, is, is different, and uh, you've heard it. I'll just repeat what I take to be one or two central points in it. Um, so this is a, a quotation from, from Deeks from a paper which is now 11 years old. It's good that we're still using it. If we decided to scrap the term simultaneity from our theoretical vocabulary, no problem would arise for doing justice to our observations. So if I understand uh, Dennis correctly, simultaneity simply is not part of our experience. We don't, we don't experience it and we don't need it in order to describe what, what we are experiencing. This ties in with the fact that relativistic theories can be given completely local formulations. Simultaneity plays no role in the dynamic laws of relativity <coughs> theory. And here's another uh, uh, slide. Um, I'll read it quickly. It is the purpose of the four-dimensional space-time picture, which the black universe is, to represent all events that actually take place in the universe, complete with all their properties and mutual relations. An adequate black universe representation therefore also contains all events in the lives of individual human beings with all the oppressions and experiences that partly constitute these events. For example, that I now remember past events and do not yet know much about what is to come is part of my experience at this instant of my life and should be part of the four-dimensional picture. The same applies to my conviction that exactly now it is now. All actual events, experiences, and intuitions must be there in the black representation, exactly at the space-time position where they actually occur. So, and this is my emphasis, the bold 
There cannot be any conflict between experience and the black universe. So, two words about the difference between uh, Dennis and, and, and uh, Janan Ismail. If I understand Dennis correctly, the scientific depiction of reality is complete. And if we, if we elaborate it uh, properly, it will lack no details, including all of the psychology uh, that, that matters uh, to us so much. So we can, um, within the black universe, which has no flow, no passage, and so on, give a complete and um, accurate phenomenology. In other words, what we take, what you know, I take, and some few, James, <laughs> take to be passage, or the, the, the real distinction between past, present, and future, and some simultaneity, these things are not part, it's not just that they're not part of physics, they're not part of phenomenology either. And I think that's a difference, it may be a difference between uh, Dix's proposal and Janan, because for Janan, I think, um, we have to find within the physics something that is not in the physics ex explicitly. So it's not over and above the physics, but there's, it's not there explicitly. In, 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 in the physical de depiction, the explicit, depic the explicit depiction is the black universe. And that's something that Dennis and Janan share. But I think Janan thinks that within this picture, we need to find things that are not there explicitly. Whereas if I understand this, this correctly, Whatever is there explicitly is all we need to give a, 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 a faithful depiction of our position in reality, including all our experiences and, and so on. Um, so what both achieve, and I think uh, what is common is greater than the differences in, in, in this case, what both achieve is a, a relief of the tension between um, the experienced image and the scientific image. Um, how? So in the case of, of, of Dennis, if I understand <coughs> Dennis, the black universe simply is the home to everything. We don't need to superimpose on it anything else. Even if, okay, it's, it's there. And if there's no simultaneity in the black universe, it's because there's no sim we never experience simultaneity. And we never need to resort to this term in order to describe our experiences. And if there's no past and future there, it's because, again, we don't need these things to do justice to our observations. In contrast, uh, for Janan, uh, the, the tension is relieved because both the scientific and the manifest image capture reality, but one captures non-perspectival reality, that's the black universe, and the other captures perspectival reality, and the two are in harmony. Now here I wanna, I wanna add something, it's not explicit in what she says, but it's I think in between the lies that often when people uh, introduce these distinctions, on the face of it, you know, they're on a par. There's perspectival uh, experience, there's non-perspectival conceptions, and both are necessary and neither is, uh, is, 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 uh, is supreme with respect to the other. But that's not really the case. I mean, I think when you press, you do discover that the scientific image, the black universe and so on, is more fundamental. That's even true of Quine, who's famous for his uh, ontological relativity. And, um, but, but it's not very difficult to uh, get out of Quine his bias towards the ontology of physics. So he's very liberal, right? There's the ontology of physics and the biology of psychology. Each, each branch of science has its own ontology. But it's also the case, I think, in Quine that he does take the ontology of physics to be more basic in some, in some sense. And I think the, the same is true of... Uh, of the recon reconciliatory attempts of, uh, of Jinan. Um, okay, I'll skip that. Now, I, I find uh, problems with the particulars of each of these proposals. So, for example, with this, uh, Jinan's uh, notion of the view from nowhere, um, I don't think any sense can be attached to this notion. I don't think anybody... It's not that we never have a view from nowhere being, you know, the finite and... Uh, creatures that we are, I really don't think we have an idea what we mean when we use this term. I mean, you need to be God in order to get, even give content to the notion, not let alone occupy this view from nowhere. Uh, in parentheses, this is really not very related. Uh, Merleau-Ponty, who dislikes this notion of the view from uh, nowhere, contrasts it with something that does play a role in his uh, theory of perception, that's the view from everywhere, I think, 
a notion which is no less uh, problematic. Um, so uh, I have issues with the way Janan uh, sets things up. I, I don't remember, remember if there's a slide for this, I'll say it now. Um, I disagree with the very widely received description according to which when I look at this cup I don't see the real shape of the rim. I don't think I see an elliptic rim. I, I, I don't see an elliptic object. I'm looking at a round object and that's what I see. Um, I think our perceptions are veridical unless something goes wrong and we th see things directly and we see things the way they are. So there isn't this extra stage of um, divining the real shape of things from skewed perceptions that we have. I think we see things very well. Uh, and, and, and I think it's important that we remember that our experiences are extremely reliable. Um, so what is this uh, ellipse doing there? First of all, there is no ellipse there. Uh, and if you want to get an ellipse out of this thing, you got to draw it or take a picture of it or something, which are different activities than looking at it. Um, same thing about time. So these are issues I have with uh, Jenan's uh, proposal. Um, I, with, with Dennis, I have a few disagreements, uh, just to mention one, uh, how to conceive motion and how to explain the perception of motion. So Dennis presented the at-at theory and, 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 and he says justifiably so, a lot of the empirical research that goes in nowadays into, into perception by psychologists, brain scientists, cognitive scientists, and so on, Takes it almost for takes it for granted that the paradigm is indirect per indirect perception of motion as well, not just of shapes. So we internalize these static uh, snapshots and we integrate, we compute, we do something in order to to uh, yield the experience of motion. Uh, there's a paper by Laurie Paul where she elaborates this in great detail. Um, but then, but then the experience of motion is derived in some way, and just as with respect to shapes, I think we see motion directly. There's no, um, so that, that's some, these are some differences about details, but uh, the real problem is, to me at least, the, the joint agenda, that of harmonizing experience time with the time of physics. And, and the problem is not because there should be some disharmony between experience time and the time of physics, but because it is not always the case that we have to choose between harmony and disharmony. There's got to be a tension uh, for you know, a project of harmonization to, to, to come up. Um, and I don't think there is any tension between experience time. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't have how to complete the sentence because there is no other time, right? So there's no, there, the, there aren't two times. There's one time and that's the time that we experience. And it's not in tension with time as it figures in physics. And I want to demonstrate this uh, on, on this one very particular case and that is uh, uh, relativity theory. Because one of the main arguments against passage and tense and so on comes from relativity theory. It started by, by Einstein with the with statements such as those that were quoted, but then elaborated into, um, into uh, rigorous arguments by, by Putnam and, and uh, what's the name of the, then is the, I never knew how to pronounce it, so, what? You know? You should have, Ritek. Um, there's Maxwell too that uh, has a variant on that argument. Um, so I want to explain how, why I think there is no tension, and in a nutshell, the reason is that, again, you know, the vocabulary of physics is very important, very effective, but also very, very limited, and does not capture very, very many things that are part of non-scientific uh, language, experience, and so on. Um, and passage and tense just are not part of the language of physics, so there's no, we can't set up even a project for harmonizing, I'll explain this. So I'm reading that flowing time and the black universe never meet, so they do not clash, nor do they have to get along or be reconciled. Reconciliation is the word that Janani Ismail uses. Um, this is probably, I don't know if it's a good metaphor, I liked it when it came out. That reconciling time as we experience it in times and figures in physics is like reconciling Bach's coffee cantata with, with actual milk. I mean, the, the things never, 
never meet each other, right? Um, to explain this, I want to give a few, uh, a few, uh, a few very quick, a few points about how I conceive time, passage, tense, and so on. Um, so I'm starting by repeating what I said before. An event's tense location, it being past or present or future, is for me an objective property of it as any other property. I, I mean by this, that it's not perspectival. So there's nothing perspectival about the presentness of this, of this talk. And there's nothing perspectival about the pastness of, 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 of Dennis's talk. Or about the futurity of uh, today's, uh, the, the dinner that uh, each of you will have. These are, that these events are past, present, future, whatever, is, are, uh, uh, it, it, to state these, these properties, to state properties of these events, which are not perspectival. I don't want to say absolute, because that has various connotations I don't need to bring along. But at any rate, it's not perspectival. Um, Second, and this is thanks to a discussion last night, I just want to emphasize this wasn't originally in the slides, but something I've, I've written about a lot. I think it's a mistake, it's a big mistake in the metaphysics of time to try to approach tense ontologically. So the two th main theories in the, in, the, in the metaphysics of time, presentism, eternalism, the tense view, the tenseless view, whatever you want to call them, A, B, whatever, are ontological theories, namely theories that analyze the distinction between past, present, and future in terms of the reality or existence of things. And um, this was also a, a, a question that raised in the previous talk. It's true, the way these words, is real, exists, and so on, are used in the context of this debate is, is incoherent. It doesn't make you can't, the distinction, the, the real distinction between being present and being past cannot be fleshed out by saying that what is present exists or is real in contrast with what is past or future, which doesn't. It just doesn't, it just doesn't cut tenses the way we need to understand tenses. So the, all this ontological talk, uh, which has a good reason, I mean, it's an Aristotle, you can't just brush it aside too quickly. Um, there's a reason why even in Aristotle, only the present exists, um, but this would be the starting point, shouldn't be the end point of the inquiry, and the end point of the inquiry is reached once we supersede, we go beyond this uh, attempt to, to, to uh, understand tense in ontological terms. Um, once we do that, we realize that there's no forced choice between present and an eternalism, um, and, and so on. So bear that in mind, that when I say past, present, future, I mean real things, but I don't mean things that can be analyzed or described or characterized in terms of being real or not real, events being real or not real, and so on. The real objective present is given to us solely via its experiential, experiential manifestation. So, very quickly, what it means to be present, to be present means to be experience, experienced as present. Um, for an event e to be present or past or future is to be experienced as such. Uh, but this is an objective of, of property of the event, and I'm repeating what I said a minute ago, bef but elaborating a little bit. I think that to be around, and I know this will, let's not go there, will, be, will turn ugly, but I, th I, I, I honestly believe that to be around is to look round. This is very Barclian. Um, we can after that do the mathematics of uh, geometry or do whatever geometry we want, but we have to start with something and we have to start with an acquaintance with roundness and this acquaintance is given us through the senses. Um, so to be present is to be experienced as present and this definition, which has a local element in it insofar as we only experience what is in our proximate vicinity, is applicable globally. I'm connecting here to issues that uh, Dennis raised. It's applicable to any, ev any event, anywhere, uh, at any time. So, in parentheses, this is something I added as, as, as Dennis uh, was speaking. How These questions, just one second, I'll just, I'll just finish the slide, okay? So the question is, at what rate does time flow? Where does it flow to, where from, against which bank? What is it that's flowing, the river or the bank, and so on? I have answers to these questions. Good answers, I don't know, but I have answers to these questions. Um, someone wanted to... Was well, so a how, you said it, I understand how it can be applied locally. So here, I, 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 I think... I, how it can be applied globally. I'll, I'll try to demonstrate. Okay. So, 
<clears throat> we all know what it means to complain that the neighbors upstairs are being noisy, right? Or whatever. So, you know, you hear all this noise and you're asking, what the hell are they doing now in the house? And you can ask in the same way, what are they doing in the next building and in the next street? And what are they doing now in Tokyo? I think it's a perfectly straightforward answer. Uh, question. We may not have an answer, but we understand the question. And what the hell are they doing up there in Andromeda? Is in the same way. No, which way? Looking? Hmm? Hearing? No. How? I'll explain briefly and then we'll debate it. I have no problem understand. I mean, I do this all the time when I'm here, asking myself, what is my son doing now? Is he playing with his smartphone again? What is he doing now? Because I know what he's supposed to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what he is doing now. Because you don't resolve nanoseconds. But here there is billions of years to be resolved. Okay. Well, but let, let's do this more slowly. If I, if my claim is, if we understand the question, what is X doing now there? How far the there is? It's not complicated because the, because the basis for the understanding of this question, you can say, I don't understand the question. You can say, the only circumstances under which I understand the question, so one second, time. Carlo, are those in which I actually can hear or get an, a, a, a direct sensory answer to the question. So I'm limiting my world to what I can actually experience directly and so on. But if I allow that on the basis of my understanding of the question, what are they doing now there, two meters up, I can extend my understanding of this question to places that I can't experience now and to places that perhaps, you know, we won't be able to experience before 100 million years. If you accept that, then I think it makes perfectly good sense to ask what's happening now at any location. And I tie that to what was what was in my previous um, characterization of tense, namely that to be an event, that's how I understand the word. To be an event is to be in time, and to be in time is to be either past, present, or future. Right, so uh, I'm pointing Maybe out that was, under this definition, the, uh, is, uh, your, your definition of now is past life code. No. Yes, if you can look at it, it's in your past life code. I didn't say I can look at it. I didn't say that to be able to look at it is... Uh, oh, here. What defines the now for me? Or oh, here? No. You said his experience. Yeah, Carlo, no, it. I'm saying experience yeah. is, is local. I can hear and see you. Right. I can't hear and see the people in the you, next you, building. You can see me in your past life code. No, I can project my understanding of the now, which I, is grounded in my actual experiences. Of, for example, of you, to other places in space and time. Yes, and if you can, can we discuss that later or so, when he's done? I agree, and you get the light past later. Light. No, 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 I don't need, no. I'm not, I'm not identifying the now with what I can actually experience now. So it's not, it's not that the, because I see the lights of certain stars now, that, you know, the emergence of the photons from these stars is happening now. What else? So... Uh, shut up. No, 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 it's okay, Carlos. These, these, are, these are good, these are good, good uh, questions. Um, Continue. If we're not in relativity theory, that's a straightforward answer, right? Yeah. And if we're within relativity theory, then you choose a foliation and they, in, in a certain How? way, which I think is... Uh... How? Okay. I mean, so that's, that's let's leave something for the discussion. Okay. After. Um, okay. I need to br bring on board some support, so I will not read it because uh, it's too long, but uh, Whitehead <laughs> was with me. Um, uh, and uh, just number the, the second point um, to the intellectual apprehension of a meaning to the question which asks what is now immediately happening in regions beyond the cogni cogniz cognizance of our senses. So we need to have a meaning to the question what is happening now elsewhere. We of course can't answer that question unless we identify the now with a light cone. But um, I don't know what's happening now in the next building next door, right? I don't know what's happening now. I can go and check. By the time I go there, it's not going to be the now that I'm asking about, okay? But that doesn't mean that it 
it's meaningless to talk about what's happening now in the next building, or what's happening now in Paris, or in Tokyo, or on the moon, or Mars, or Andromeda. To the contrary, I think it's meaningless to think of an event as something which is neither past, nor present, nor future. It's certainly not part of how we experience things. No one here in this room has experienced directly an event which wasn't either past or present or future. Nobody has. Right? I mean, if somebody asks you, if someone calls any of you because on the phone and asks, what, what's, what are you doing now? The, the you're going to say, I'm listening to this annoying lecture. But last lesson continue, yes. Okay, yes. they tell me to continue, Carlo. <laughs> I have what? You have 50 more transparencies to go. Oh, we're not, we're not, we're not going to do all of them. <laughs> we're not going to do all of them. So just in terms of some answer to Carlo, which even appears on this slide. <laughs> Sometimes it is asked, is the now frame dependent or not? Okay? I think that's where a lot of the questions are coming from. Answering negatively would be problematic because that would imply a notion of absolute simultaneity. And saying the tense is not frame dependent seems to render it subjective, psychological. Though when we discussed this last night, this is not automatic. You need something like Putnam's argument uh, for that. Um, and I think that this is an ill-framed question. It is meaningless to add tense to physics. So Dennis said a couple, two hours ago, that it's not this, that there's no now in physics, there's as many nows as we need. Every moment is now when it is happening. So every event is present when it's happening, which is exactly the eternalist conception of tense, the, the deflationary conception of tense, because it leaves nothing of tense. It's to say things happen when they do. And that's all there is to tense. Um, and uh, I think you asked it during De De Dennis's talk, point to, to the now, which is now, now, right? So if you imagine here a coordinate system, and I say now, this is, this is now, now. And then a minute ago, this was now, and so on. Makes no sense whatsoever. And the problem is that you, physics simply doesn't, no of tense. And you can't impose tense into physics. Taking a coordinate system or whatever representation of the successive states of a system and saying this is where the system is now is not adding now to physics. Just as using a calendar and saying this is today it's the whatever 22nd doesn't add the present into the calendar. A calendar is not something that represents or can capture time in any way. It's a device that we use for various purposes. And pointing at a calendar and saying, this is where, this is, today it's the 22nd, is not introducing tense into the calendar. And pointing at, you know, the way a, 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 a physical representation represents the successive, successive states of the system and saying this is where the system is now is fine, it's good, and many times it's important to do it, but that's not in introducing the now into physics. Physics is deaf and mute when it comes to tense. And so the supposed uh, difficulty of you know, shoving tense into relativity theory is not a real, is not a real difficulty. So there's no question of squaring or reconciling tense with physics, of harmonizing passage of relativity, because the now never enters physics and cannot be added to it. Flowing time and physical time never meet, so they do not clash, nor do they have to get along, be reconciled. Experience is not deceptive, to the contrary, it is very reliable. Also when we do science, though of course we are not infallible, this has to do with uh, the little discussion here about illusions, I think, again, it's a misuse of the word illusion to say that uh, um, our experience of flow is, is, uh, is an illusion. Um, again, just in one sentence, we, can, we use the word illusion, for example, in uh, the, the slide Dennis put up of, of the, the illusion of motion, when there are circumstances in which we can have a veridical experience. The word illusion is always a contrast between the way things appear under certain cir circumstances and the way they really are. And if we don't ha have access to the way things really are, we cannot contrast the way things appear to us with anything. This contrast is, is crucial to the use of the word illusion. So, you know, the, 
the two lines with the auxiliary lines to the sides that are equal at length but look unequal in length, um, that's an illusion because we can easily erase those auxiliary, auxiliary lines and verify, use a ruler to verify that the two lines are in fact equal in length. If you can't access the way things really are, then the basic conditions for talking about illusion are absent. And that's something that always troubled me about, uh, about the tensor theory. Because, for example, Meller, at least in the 80s, did you talk about tensors and illusion. And the question that, you know, had to be presented was, okay, what, what is real reality that I'm misperceiving here? Um, again, it came up in the discussion, so I, I, I'm just mentioning it. I don't like the notion the species present, because the present is not species. Species is ghost-like, not real. Basically, the species present um, is a psychological present, and I take presentness to be objective, not psychological. Um, physics does not yield a new description of all ordinary experience. It leads to new understanding of some experience. For example, when we look at the stars, so we know that the light that we see has been traveling through the universe for millions of years or hundreds of millions of years or whatever it is. Um, hundreds of thousands, if it's, well, most of the stars are within a galaxy, so it's not millions, but whatever. Um, but it doesn't revolutionize the vast majority, practically every other ex description of experiences that we have. Um, time dilation revolutionizes how we use calendars. I think, I hope this will answer, probably not, but we'll leave some for later. So, you know, you have relativity theory and you understand there are many calendars. You need to see what your situation is in order to know which calendar to use, but that's what you're doing. You, when I'm asking what's happening on Andromeda, which calendar I'm using may depend on, you know, whether I'm walking in this direction in the room or in this direction in the room. That's something that relativity taught us. But by uh, correcting our use of calendars in pretty extreme situations, we are not introducing tense into physics. Um, so that, so I, I think the big revolution in, in relati that relativity brought about to our conception of time has to do with this, with how you know, time dilation and its consequences, but not with what Einstein uh, 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 declared and many following him still declare that t relativity has eliminated the tense and passage from our conception of the world. Um, perception of motion, I'll skip that, we spoke about it. I just, uh, am sure, do you know this letter by Einstein? It was written in 52. It corroborates in part what I want to say. I just want to use it to flesh out more clear, clearly what I think is, is the moral of, of, of this whole analysis. So it's to some lady, Mrs. Levitova, who asked him whatever she asked, and he says, your conception of time is the only one possible in accordance with physics for the following reasons. Physics no knows only different values of time, but has no possibility of expression for now, present, for past, and for future. So there's no possibility of expression for passage and for tense within physics. And the second point has to do with how this the, the whole issue of tense and passage becomes even more complicated with relativity, the last passage, this feature of exact science was, n was keenly felt and attacked by Henri Bergson, in parenthesis, in my opinion, without justification. But remember these words, has no possibility of expression. Now, the, these words are interpreted very differently by people who are on opposing side of this debate. So though physicalists, I'll just shorten everything, physicalists take these words to mean that um, <coughs> their tense and passage are not part of the world because physics can't express them. And if physics can't express them, they can't be real. Now, I take it to mean something very different, that physics doesn't have anything to say about tense and passage. This was added yesterday. It has nothing to do with my talk, but yes. the day before yesterday, $1.3 million were paid for this note, not far from my house in Jerusalem, in which Einstein gives instructions to an elevator boy in Tokyo who had to be happy. And I don't read German, but from the Hebrew translation, I understand that his advice was, 
Uh, be humble and don't aspire to great success. And as every parent know, nothing is better than personal experience. So I guess that's what he based this note on uh, himself. He gave it as a tip to the elevator boy because he didn't have change. Um, and I don't know if the elevator boy is still alive, but if he is, he should have hung on to this uh, piece of paper. From what I remember from, uh, from Russell's book on Western philosophy, that was, uh, that, that was Leibniz's method of giving uh, wedding gifts. So he wouldn't give you a, an actual gift, he would give you a piece of advice. Do you remember this in uh, Russell? So the, 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 the bride would get usually the advice to go on showering even after the wedding. <laughs> and it's Leibniz. It's, uh. So that physics is voiceless about X, that's how I want to understand this, or in Einstein's words, has no possibility of expression for X, does not automatically entail that X is not part of reality. The entailment requires further metaphysical, not scientific assumptions, such as uh, physicalism. Um, and think of the many, many things about which physics is completely silent. It has no, no voice at all. All the entire normative dom domain is outside the domain of physics. And to you know, collapse normativity on psychology, psychology and chemistry, biology, the, the, the reduction at this point, I think, is more hand-waving than, than an actual uh, uh, proposal. Um, and a few concluding remarks about this. I just want to make sure that these really are concluding remarks before I get to the last point, last part, which is very brief. Um, so sometimes people invoke the distinction between fundamental and real, and I just want to reiterate flow. If there is any sense to this distinction, I'm not sure what, that I understand it, but if I do, whatever I understand by it, flow is fundamental. Temporal direction is inextricable from passage, then time used in physics assumes human time, to the extent that you know, the time physics is not directed, the direction comes from human time. And, um, and in light of this, and connecting to previous talks, especially Carlos, I never understood the appeal to, to the past hypothesis. I mean, the past hypothesis really is, um, and, 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 and I, I copied this uh, quotation during Dennis's talk, additional wheels without added empirical content. The only motive is to tell a story that is pleasing to our, and here I changed it a little bit, physicalist ears. So why, why do we need the past hypothesis? To explain directionality as we experience it. Well, what's wrong with having physics without direction? What's wrong with that? Why do we need to impose direction on physics? I'm not, and I'm not saying you can't get the f direction out of physics, but let's say you can't. Just let's play that game for a moment. Let's say you can't get direction out of physics. Why do you need to insist on finding it in there? As far as I can tell, the only reason is this prejudice that it's not, if it's not in the physics, it can't be real. Um, Similarly, I don't think that direction and passage, of course there's a lot of research to do by brain scientists, biologists, whatever, about you know, the clock in the brain, the way we process temporal information, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of research to do about, and this is done, Josh Green is probably, Josh, is, Josh Green's work is probably most famous about this, what happens in the brain when we deliver it morally, when we're faced with a trolley, dilemma and so on. He puts people in MRIs and put, gives them the trolley problem, checks what happens in their brain. That's, you know, produces a lot of very interesting scientific uh, data, hypotheses, suggestions, and so on. But, and this is a problem in Josh because he doesn't completely accept this, but this doesn't teach us what, mo what right and wrong are. It teaches us what happens in our brain when we're thinking about what's right and what's wrong, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. But it's not automatic at any rate, I think this is, can't be disputed. It's not automatic to identify what happens with the brain, in the brain when we deliver it morally with a moral domain. I think the same is true of time. It's important to study what happens, but it's a mistake to, 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 to take whatever we see in the brain as constituting time. Um, and in this context, I also wanted to express some reservation from the, uh, from the prevalent proposal that's in Meller, already back in the 90s, that our experience of passage is a byproduct of natural selection, because 
if we don't have these eight beliefs, we're not going to survive. That's how Meller presents it in his book. Um, you know, to take the medication on time, I need to know that it's now one o'clock. That's an eight belief, and even though we live in a tenseless reality, our brains are structured in such a way, due to natural selection, that they produce these A beliefs, without which we wouldn't survive, and that's all there is to tense. You already know I... Um, okay, again, some reference to stuff Dennis said, I'll skip it. I, um, okay, so the, the last question, and, and when time runs out, just cut me. I, uh, if you um, said one hour and ten minutes. So I'll do this in four, four minutes. Um, haven't been in doing this for a while. I, I find myself asking myself more and more why. I mean, it's the debate concerning, for example, and I'll move on to the second slide, concerning tense, you know, it's like political debates. It's very rare to run into people being one over. So I guess the point is not to convince a tenseless theorist that, you know, they're wrong or vice versa. Um, <clears throat> but what is the purpose of, of, of doing this metaphysics of time? What is the, pur what, what is the purpose of uh, arguing whether the black universe is a faithful and complete representation of temporal reality or not? Um, and accompanying this, this, this uh, well-known debate is this meta-debate about whether it's important to alleviate the tensions between uh, the manifest image and the scientific image of time or uh, whatever. And I, I really don't know what to say so much about uh, these particular questions. I, I, I will say this. To me, it's obvious at the moment, at least, and I think, you know, something has to happen for this to change, that whether time is tensed or not is not a question for physics. I mean, physics has an answer, but whoever doesn't want to accept this answer won't. It's not, there's nothing in the physics itself that imposes on us the tenseless view. Um, now, what can decide it? I mean, uh, conceptual analysis, some kind of philosophical argumentation, I don't know, but I, I, I think it's important to, um, to, to stress this, that this is not a problem for, for science. And, let me just run quickly to the quotation from Bengtsson. So in that meeting, I think it's in that same meeting, um, Bengtsson re replied to Einstein, telling him that a metaphysics grafted upon science is not, forget the it, is not science. Um, by which I think what he was trying to say is, I'm not arguing with you, Einstein, about relativity theory. I'm not a physicist and I'm not arguing about the physics. There is a, a philosophical disagreement between us and it is philosophical. You cannot parade relativity theory as a move inside a philosophical discussion. Right? So, tensed or not, you can take relativity theory and write arguments like Putnam's or Maxwell's and so on that purport to use relativity theory as one of the premises in an argument, the conclusion of which is that tense is an illusion, but these arguments don't work. These particular arguments don't work, maybe others will. I mean, this is not, I'm not covering all the ground, but the arguments that we know <coughs> do not provide any kind of conclusive uh, proof that our experience of passage and so on is illusory or um, which is, I think, one of Dennis's motivations in saying uh, our experiences are not illusory because what you claim is part of the experience is not really part of experience. You think simultaneity is part of the experience or flow and so on. It's not. But for those who think that we do experience reality as tensed and so on, there's, there is no argument that comes from relativity that conclusively refutes that. Um, and it's important to, to, to not forget it because, as I said, sometimes uh, science is used in the context of philosophical discussions um, where the claims that are being made are philosophical and not, and, and, uh, not scientific. Um, <clears throat> 
here, the, with respect to these two questions, the, there's a little table that I made of the possible positions. I made it because <coughs> it's the first and last time that I'll be on the same table with Einstein. <laughs> unless I decide to make another table. Um, so there are you know, two options. Reality is tense or is not tense. And I, I mentioned I, uh, Jelani Ismail and Einstein as, 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 the two, as representing the two options. Though there is the comment that uh, if we'll have time, I'll read from Carnap's autobiography. But in all his public statements, Einstein was very adamant. Reality is not tense. Um, uh, and then there's the question of whether there is tension between the, the manifest image and the scientific image. So Janani Smell and Einstein think there is, a, there is a, some tension that has to do with this quotation. Um, no tension. I think that Dennis and I agree that there's no tension between the scientific image and the manifest image, but for very different reasons. Dennis thinks that the scientific image captures, absorbs, swallows the, the uh, manifest image, and I think they never meet, and that's why there's no tension. Um, uh, so these are the various uh, possibilities. That's a quotation from uh, Carnap's autobiography. Um, in which he reports that Einstein did not feel very comfortable, at least not all the time, with his very staunch statements concerning the unreality of passage. Um, so he, once Einstein said that the problem of the now worried him seriously, he explained that the experience of the now means something special for man, something essentially different from the past and the future, but that this important difference does not and cannot occur within physics which is true, that this experience cannot be grasped by science seemed to him a matter of painful but inevitable resignation. That's a strong statement, right? Um, I remarked that all that occurs objectively, and Carnap did not uh, share this, uh, th this worry. I remarked that all that occurs objectively can be described in science, but Einstein thought that these scientific descriptions cannot possibly satisfy our human needs, that there is something essential about the now which is just outside the realm of science. We both agreed that this was not a question of a defect for which science could be blamed, as Bergson thought. I don't know what Bergson thought, but I think that up to, up, oops, up to, um, up to this point, Bergson would have agreed. Up to the last sentence, Bergson would have, would have agreed that the, 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 there is a problem. It's not, we can't just brush tense and, 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 and passage aside because, as I said at the opening of the talk, they're crucial to our understanding of ourselves as human and uh, our understanding of our, of our place inside uh, reality. Short Einstein never wrote something to this effect. This is Carnap's memory interpretation of what Einstein said. Right. I, I'm assuming he didn't invent it. Einstein but, uh, seemed to be at peace with the idea that there was no time. No. That's not, uh, that was not Carnap's impression at all. But what he wrote well, we can Einstein. doubt Carnap's impression. You're right, yeah. But we usually rely on Carnap's uh, <laughs> impressions in his autobiography, so I... We rely more on what Einstein wrote. Um, it's an interesting question, by the way, why, why in a private conversation with someone he respected and liked, if he expressed himself in this way, he, did, he expressed himself in this way and refused to ever make such sentiments public, if you doubt that these were his real sentiments. Um, <coughs> So back to my meta question, is this debate at all important? Uh, and, and I don't know. Um, I'm just toying with the three ways in which it may be important. I am not sure. So one, one way in which the debate tends or not tends, there is a tension, there isn't a tension, may be important, is because, it may, because the, there could be some actual impact of philosophy and physics on each other. What, uh, what Sebastian called yesterday bare, bare theories. So I don't know, and, and you know, I think people here are in a, a, a much better position than I am to assess this question, whether questions, ideas, hypotheses that come from philosophy actually work themselves into the way th the theories of scientists look, and vice versa. I myself tend to be a bit skeptical, but I brought a quotation from Robert Dissal, who does think that such influences exist. And he says, philosophy is not an independent source of knowledge of space-time. <coughs> Our ability to conceive of or to reason about space is always dependent on principles borrowed explicitly or implicitly from physics. 
But this is not to say that physics simply provides answers to philosophical questions from its own sources. Rather, it says that there are times at which philosophical analysis has become an unavoidable task for physics itself. So I think uh, Robert Dissas takes physics and, 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 and philosophy to be engaged in a joint, uh, joint venture and a joint program and to have serious, real impact on each other. Maybe it's not on the level of the bare theories, but on the level of the interpretation of theories. Um, may, you know, there's relativity theory and this debate that, that we're in the midst of has to do with how we interpret the theory. Do we take the theory to prove that tense is an illusion, as Putnam thought at the time, and maybe Einstein thought throughout his life? Um, or do we somehow try to understand relativity theory in a way that um, that coheres better with, with our initial naive, mundane experiences of uh, passage and tense. Uh, perhaps there is some dialogue between physics and philosophy on, on the level of interpreting uh, these theories. Um, if there is, then I, I suppose it would be relevant to, to issues that came up here, such as the quantiza quantization of space and time, given that space and time are continuous and from the Bilksun. Uh, uh, dealt with a lot, the continuity, and James, and Whitehead, they all had a lot of, a lot of uh, research into the continuity of space and time, given that space and time are experiences continuous, and if uh, science tells us that they're not, I suppose there's a real need for some kind of dialogue on this issue on, on the conceptual level. Um, similarly, and here I'm, I'm going, get, maybe I've been there all the time, going to territory that is completely uh, foreign to me, but I too hear talks in which uh, the emergence of space and time uh, from something else comes up, and, and at least I am intrigued by what that could mean. So a soup of tetrahedrons that undergo condensation, a process from which space and time emerge, this is a description that for me is a bit mind-boggling because Okay, so the tetrahedrons don't have to actually be spatial. It's a geometric uh, a term derived out of a geometric theory. But then again, I guess the same kind of, uh, of explanation would go into the use of the word process to describe what yields space and time. So there's something pre-spatial and pre-temporal. -pre I think, I think it, uh, it was uh, Carlo that asked this, where, where does the pre-geometric theory live? So if was it you? It was if me. it's it was you. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Steve. So if 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 this thing is happening, I mean, so something is happening, but it's not happening in any in any sense that we're familiar with because it's not spatial and it's not temporal. And um, to the extent that these theories uh, are viable, some some analysis uh, uh, is required. And here I I would like to suggest that just in the, as in the case of special relativity, philosophical. Uh, insistence on, on what we mean by our words and what we could mean by our words may be important, may be important. I think that just as with special relativity, someone has to resist the um, acceptance, too easily at least, of, of, of claims that we don't really know how to wrap our minds around, such as that the events are neither past or present or future. Uh, and maybe, and this is on the most abstract level, an impact, uh, again, I'm on the question is whether it's important to decide whether reality is tense or not tense, and you know, if, there's a, if there is a tension, there is a tension in how we perceive reality, maybe an impact on our general view of reality and of our place in it. Uh, uh, deciding can have an, an impact in this, in this sense. So passage like normativity, aesthetics, ethics, colors, causation, whatever, experience of music, are central to our uh, general view of reality. And we all, we all take these things seriously, and in many contexts give them more weight than we, than we give to our scientific theory. I mean normativity, right, wrong, is, ought, and so on. Um, <clears throat> Perhaps there's something to be said in favor of articulating a view of reality which gives the significance that all these things enjoy in our lives um, rather than uh, be cornered into apologetics, which is what I think happens to us when we endorse physicalism as our view of reality. 
once we endorse physicalism as a view of reality, we need to start explaining what normativity is, where morality comes in, is it? And there are books, I, I, I meant to, 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 to list and I forgot, but there are quite a few books written by philosophers who bite the bullet, as it were, and, 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 and relegate all of morality, all of aesthetics, to the illusory, together with flow. So just as flow is not passage, temporality is not part of real reality, bad and good, right and wrong, ugly and beautiful, all these things are not part of real reality either. They're kind of illusions or psychological side effects of you know, natural selection, whatever. And I find these, uh, these suggestions uh, troubling on a, on, a, on a philosophical level and troubling um, in the sense that we don't live this way. And when there's this conflict between how we perceive reality and how we live in it, uh, when this conflict uh, erupts, I think, I think that is a tension we should try to get rid of. I think that was enough. Should have brought my helmet now. Um, let's forget about relativity. What do you make of uh, Boltzmann, 1897, which gave what, we, what I would consider as a solid proof that the flow is illusory, the flow of time, when he, you know this thing, no? So he explained that uh, there could be uh, anti-chronal uh, domains of space-time, uh, and <coughs> uh, bubbles in space-time where the time flow is not the same in this part of the bubble and this part, and some of them could exist now in our universe, in your sense of now. So there would be other people discussing now uh, time in another galaxy, but what they would call uh, future is what we call past and things like that. And this is fully compatible with the law of Newtonian <coughs> physics. Okay? Uh, we don't know, probably it does not exist in our physical universe, but it could exist. So what do you make of this? <laughs> not much. Um. <laughs> you don't feel how strong it is against the idea that there is one flow of time, a la Bergson? No. Okay. I, uh, I think that um, whatever story we hear, whether it comes from science or from elsewhere, we can only make sense of in terms of you know, the language that is at our possession and which is available to us. And the notion of the reversal of the direction of the flow of time, which comes up in various contexts, not this one, is one that I've never really, I've never really understood. You know, there's the, 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 Feynman, the, the Feynman statement that the positron is an electron going backwards in time and stuff like that. No, no, but this is very simple and Newtonian, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, the fact, you know, it may be compatible in some sense with Newtonian physics, may be compatible in some sense with, with post-Newtonian physics. The, it still needs to make sense, you know, it's Meller, which, you know, I, I disagree with much of what, with his position at large, but I think, you know, I had brilliant uh, arguments, thinks that um, time travel, something that Carlo mentioned, is, uh, is, is an incoherent notion. And the fact that maybe you can make room for, for it within, you know, a physical theory, whether it's the Gödel uh, loops or whatever, being in some sense, which needs to be defined compatible with physics, doesn't make it, not, not only does it not make it possible, it doesn't yet make it meaningful even. So, the fact that something appears in a, in a, in a theory of, in a scientific theory, surely does not secure that it's possible, but it doesn't even warrant its meaningfulness. I think. If I may try to answer, uh, I would say that um, the notion of uh, flowing time, of now, it's related to an observer. Without an observer, it's this. Oh, but they have two observers there. Yes, but they are completely separated. Yes, they have no communication between them. Mm -hmm. Just to, could you elaborate a little bit on the idea of per perspective, the way you, at some point, discarded the notion that tense was perspectival, perspectival um, because there's one easy way to interpret everything you said in a kind of uh, <coughs> a, a, a neutral way. I mean, neutral as to the question whether uh, there is an absolute time or one 
global time flow. With it. You could, I could very well agree with everything you said in terms of uh, tense being inherent in the universe, and yet allow for the underdetermination of the, the tenses. The fact that, in fact, there are many ways of attributing simultaneity relations depending upon, well, you might not want to call it perspective, but let's say the, the relational configuration you're considering between mm -hmm. the, an, observer, an, an observer and the rest of the universe, or um, there will be different time ascriptions or tense ascriptions. And one same event could be past, future, or present. So I agree with the, the first part, which is, I mean, it's not tenseless because it's underdetermined. Uh, underdetermined, but yet yeah, there is this notion of under or over determination, mm. which is a different way of putting it. And how can you mm. avoid the very notion of perspective, because or relational perspective, if you like? Well, I, I, what's I, wrong about it? I think uh, the notion of perspective has has many meanings in different contexts, but um, I wouldn't. And, you know, again, I know I'm stepping into a big uh, swamp here, but uh, I, I wouldn't call this the, the, the assertion that this table is two meters long a perspectival. It's frame dependent, surely, once, you know, if you, if you accept special relativity, then it's the length, the, the length is, 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 is frame dependent, the, the shape is, spent, is, is, is uh, frame-dependent and so on, but frame-dependent and, and perspectival, I think, are not interchangeable, they're not synonymous. Maybe you, you, you perspectival for you means subjective, is, is that the... More, the yeah, again, I don't want to identify perspectival with subjective either, but it's more tilting okay. in that direction, okay. right. Because yeah. as Whitehead, uh, since you showed his face yeah. and quoted him, also yeah. said that perspect perspectives are embedded within nature. Mm -hmm. They're not projected by the mind or mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. They are there. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and what, everything you said could be co made compatible with that kind of objectivist view of perspective. Yeah. But so, no, I want to distance myself okay. from it a little bit. So, you know, I, 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 when I'm looking at the cup, I'm looking at, at it from a certain perspective, but I see the cup as it is. And when I measure the, the table, when I'm sta stationary with respect to it, I measure its length. I get its actual length. I mean, I don't think there's anything uh, subjective about that. Okay. Uh, uh, I, um, I don't want to enter specific details. Uh, let me tell you how, how it sounds to me. This so let me tell you how annoyed maybe, I am. Maybe I, maybe I, I get it wrong. But, um, there is a text of uh, 2,000 years ago which says uh, uh, around the earth the, the, the up uh, is down and the down is up. Uh, and, uh, and it continues for a while like that. It's, it's totally incomprehensible. Uh, it's totally contradictory until you realize uh, that uh, uh, this is uh, around the third century when people were trying to make sense of the fact that the earth is a sphere and the other is not a sphere like an orange that is an up and down. It's a sphere where where the app changes when, when it goes around. It was a hard change of uh, uh, intuition to accept that this is possible. Still in uh, the Middle Ages, everybody accepted that this, the Earth is a sphere, uh, but uh, the actual description, if you go in the text, is, is, is complicated. If you, go, if you walk, you come back to the same place. I mean, the intuition had to adjust to that uh, because it is my fundamental intuition of reality that there is an up and down. I, it's hard for me to think about the reality is not an up and down. Now, Newton equation does not have an up and down. It seems to me that uh, there is a completely coherent story that we all accept, even the men of the street now accept, uh, that outside the Earth, far into the planet is the space, there is no up and down. There is nothing illusory in up and down. There is nothing... You can use perspectival, you can use subject, you can use the word, but, but the thing is uncontroversial. Up and down are real, are real here, are part of my experience. If I want to take this part of my experience and globalize to the universe as a whole, I do something wrong. So I have to... Um, it happened the same in the Renaissance with the motion of the Earth, right? Are we moving? No, we're not moving. I mean, we're very still. But we make sense of it. So it seems to me that what you're doing here is that you take the notion of time as, as a unique ball somehow and saying, my experience of time is so, 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 and so. That's the only way I can think. Therefore, I refuse to think 
that temporality universe could be more complex. And, and the key point is that, it seems to me, I mean, forget what Einstein said in blah blah, because I thought about it. The key point, seems to me, is that uh, you say, since I don't view this tenses, uh, not local tenses, but global tenses, since in physics I don't view a common present all over the universe, I don't view, therefore in physics there is no time whatsoever, which I think is a wrong step. Physics is plenty of time, I and mean, if you go in a physics book, it's time every other page. Um, physics is not a block universe. Physics is about phase space, uh, which are deeply modeled. This is about quantum mechanics. If you do that, then you measure that. This time all over in physics. I and mean, physics is think in terms of time. In fact, physics is all about how things change in time. Um, nevertheless, the time of physics loses some aspect of our direct intuition of time, and you react saying, oh, therefore, there should be something that physics does not capture. Like if uh, Newton theory, there's something that does capture because it doesn't see the high and low. So it seems to me that the story is simpler. Um, I do think, and I, I, I told Dennis, that in, in, in the physicalist talk, uh, there is this uh, bad habit of saying, oh, we have discovered that there is no uni universal now in the universe. <coughs> that the universe does not make sense in terms of universal now. Therefore, we have discovered that now does not exist. That's I think the now is illusory. I think that's a bad step. Now is all over our physical books. I, I, I teach generativity by drawing our light code, saying that's the future, that's the past, uh, that, that's the future, that's the past, that's more than the present because there's no present, and the student asks, what is in the center? So that's an app. That's the thing that in every moment we... So, um, uh, uh, this complexity of time is what is missing in, in, in your... In, in what I hear, and there's a sort of, uh, allow me, arrogance in saying my own intuition, uh, of course, is right and is wrong, nobody questions your own intuition, mm -hmm. has to be valid uh, for atoms, molecules, quantum gravity, galaxies everywhere, but we know that our intuition go wrong on, the, on the different scales. Well, lots of uh, points came up in what you said, but when you, when you teach general relativity, special relativity, whatever, okay, you draw this, the cone and so on, but you can do all of that with before and after. You don't need now. It's true that it's very hard for us to resist using these words because, you know, they're part of our every, every moment of our lives. But I don't think, and, and I mean, obviously there's time in physics. The question isn't, I never questioned that, but the, but the time that when you do physics, you use... A global time or a local time? A global time. A glo whatever. The, you know, it could be frame dependent. Could do, could do, but wait a sec. What is not in physics, and I said before, and I still <coughs> insist, is tense. These are two very different notions. So, of course, you use time. But you don't need to talk about future, the future cone and the past cone. You can point to the, point, to the, to the origin and say this is later and this is earlier. You don't need past, present, and future. You certainly do not, I, I, I'm assuming, you're not drawing whatever you're drawing and showing them passage because it's not there. You can't show passage on, a, on anything that you draw. You just can't. Physically, you can't. So, I'm not disputing that time is there, and I'm not disputing that you know, physics comes with various, sometimes startling, revolutionary claims about time, such as time dilation, some, such as perhaps quantization of time, and so on. But what I was saying was that all this does not impact on our fundamental understanding of time, which is human, which is tense, which, uh, and in which time flows. Moreover, I think that physics presupposes this time in various ways. But, but among, other, among other ways, physics is, is, is empirical and experimental and, you know, our experiences are our experiences. So, it's not that I'm taking, you know, Yuval's understanding of the world from this little cubicle and imposing it on, on the rest of the universe. Um, I'm just stating what I think is true for everybody. I mean, I'll, I'll quote... Uh, uh, Diego. Diego, sorry. Uh, we all agree that uh, Dennis's talk is over. 
and mine, unfortunately, is still going on. So this is present, that is past. I mean, this is not, contra not uh, uh, controversial. The question is, how do we understand these, these very everyday simple statements? And, you know, there's a long tradition that, as Dennis said, has become very dominant. And um, oppressive, I would say. According to which, there's only one way to understand these statements, and that is pertaining to our psychology or whatever, but not the time. And that's what I'm arguing against. Now, the example that you use often about up and down is a very good example. I mean, it puts a lot of stress on, 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 on my, my position. Um, but I think, I, I, I think the, the situation there, too, is, is a bit more uh, complicated, and I'll just one sentence. You say these are real relations <coughs> in some sense. By way, and I understand you to mean by that that they actually, well, they're not subjective. Uh, otherwise, I don't understand what you mean when you insist that these are real. I, I, I take it to mean that they're in the world. And this is a very, very tricky move, which has been done by, you know, people that we, that I, you know, study from, such as Milo Ponti. Um, to take the up-down relationship is actually part of reality, <coughs> um, not in any way that is capturable by physics, no, but in a way, but, it, but, no, but despite that, no less <coughs> real than the, 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 than the things that are in physics. And moreover, as part of some background that enables us to do physics. I know this sounds wacky, I mean, but there is a notion in which our head is on top and our legs are on the bottom, which is more than just, you know, our subjective way of thinking of these things. Yes, and it's compatible with the fundamental description of the world where there's no up and down. <coughs> Maybe it's compatible, but the fundamental description of the world misses it. That's all I'm it saying. Doesn't. It doesn't. How can you get the up-down of a human body? You have a mass, and uh, every time there's a big mass, this is Newtonian physics, there's a force in one direction, mm. and uh, <laughs> the opposite direction. Yeah, okay, no, I understand ah, where, where we miss it, we're, we're not understanding each other. I think when Merleau Ponty, so for it's, example... It's, it's localized, yeah. of course, it's relational, depending where you know, one is, it has all the bad properties that you want, but it's perfectly real and comprehensible. I, th I think, and that's why I know I'm, this is a very tricky area, when they talk about, the phenomenologists talk about up-down, they mean more than that. They mean, sure, all that is in the physics, you know. They mean up-down in, 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 uh, in, in a broader, richer meaning uh, than just, uh, you know, spatial direction. There's a, there's, a, there's a significance beyond just the spatial relationship to saying that one's head is up and their legs are down. Okay, there were two questions by Steve and Ted. For, so do we have time for both? Short questions, short answers, maybe? Because it's already 1.30. So maybe Steve was I'll first, in fact, and then Ted. Okay. I'll try to make it short. The answer might not be. Um, I'll, I'll make it short. <laughs> so I, I want to understand what you mean by matter. When you were talking about this, you said that it made sense to you to ask, what is your son doing now? At the time you said that, you were walking. <coughs> I was here sitting. We would disagree on what your son was doing now, even though we agreed that we were asking about the same now mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. Which one of us is right? This, I'll give a very short answer. Um, you know, if we measure the length of this table and I'm walking and you're sitting, we're going to get different answers. And neither of us is wrong and neither of us is right if we're doing it properly. Okay, so then now is not... Uh, so now it's no, it's not an absolute simultaneity okay. that uh, it's an observer right. dependent. Yes, right. Okay. Which I don't count as perspectival. It goes back to it. meaning not subjective. Right. So to better understand your viewpoint and also just to raise a, a relevant question, I think one of the approaches to quantum gravity that's fascinating is this Hartle-Hawking no boundary wave function for the universe. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but in that setting, the idea is that you the wave function specifies an amplitude for all possible 
uh, space-like configurations of geometry and matter. And <coughs> the story of time in this, it's not clear yet whether this really makes sense, whether it's technically right or anything, but it's, it's a possibility that physics could make sense of in the future. It might really be physics-wise the right way to describe cosmology. But if it is, what it says is that, you know, all we have is these, an amplitude for each possible configuration. If we try to go backwards in time, time sort of dissolves into a Euclidean signature geometry where there is no time. And um, what would you, you know, suppose that next week it was established that this was the correct description of quantum cosmology. Would that affect, would you give the same talk the week after that? Um, you know, due to my lack of familiarity with the, with the theories you're talking about, I, I can't really answer. I, I need to, you know, these are, these are serious, mathematically very heavy theories which I would need to master before I could say that. But more generally, um, there's a part of me that says yes and a part of me that says no. The part of me that says yes, I would give the same talk, is that part that takes tense and passage to be non-scientific issues. It's, at the moment, at least, from whatever we have available to us, uh, cannot be connected to science. So it's, it's impossible for me to envision a scientific development in the view of which, or in light of which, I would say, you know, passage is an illusion. Which is not to say it couldn't happen. Could happen, but before it happens, I can't imagine it. And the part of me that says, no, I probably, I may not be giving the same talk, connects exactly to that, you know, <coughs> Quine and Putnam, you know, have stressed following James, by the way, that in some sense, everything is revisable. There are no beliefs that we can commit to from now till forever. At the same time, it doesn't mean that at any given moment in time, any statement makes sense. You know, for sen what, make, what sentences make sense and how is kind of uh, background dependent. And the background changes. So, at Given where we are, I'd say these are non-scientific questions. Whatever happens in quantum gravity is not going to change the fact that time passes. And I qualify that by saying this is, it's true to say this now. What's going to be correct? What, what, is, what is going to be the correct, correct to say in two weeks or in two years or 20 years? Who knows? Just to summarize my reaction to you, it's sort of like what, how maybe little you understand physics is how little I understand philosophy. <laughs> However, I've read a little bit about Kant. Mm -hmm. And my impression of Kant is he was just wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, he was an overconfident philosopher mm -hmm. who ex thought that he could anticipate what's true about reality just no, by you, philosophy. No, you did not read Kant correctly. <laughs> what? I can tell you, you did not understand Kant. I, 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 oh, okay. I, I think what, what you're saying, I, I'm, I'm overconfident without being Kant. That's, uh, that's, that's terrible. But this confidence is fake. I really, I really am... Um, Fake news. I, uh, I really, um, you know, I, 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 I present what I present. I'm full of doubts about, about a lot of it. I've learned from my teachers, you know, the, the Putnam, Quine, and all these, that uh, we can't dismiss Kant as wrong too quickly. I mean, right, for Kant, you know, Euclidean geometry is a priori, which means universal and necessary, and so on and so forth. Um, he, he was a very, very serious thinker, Kant, and, uh, and, and there are some defenses, valid defenses of... of okay, one of thing he said, definitely said and wrote, first analogy of experience, time does not pass. Everything passes except time. And that's the... And it's time now. So I think he was mistaken. Thank you. <laughs>